Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this webinar. I'm your host, Hiran Amin. You've probably heard of the expression, high risk, high reward. Well, you can think of that as a tagline of sorts when it comes to small cap stock investing. Now, small cap companies are generally defined as those with a market value below $1.5 billion or so. The allure of those is that successful ones might grow faster than their larger firms, and therefore they provide more upside profit potential. But they also lack the financial security of those larger competitors, and thus they tend to be more volatile when it comes to trading. So investors do need to trade carefully when investing in small cap stocks, and it can be difficult trying to strike that balance between risk and chasing those opportunities. But today, we're going to have some help in navigating the small cap arena from an industry professional who spent more than 20 years researching small cap stocks. Peter Hodson is the founder and head of research at 5i Research, an independent provider of equity research. Hello, Peter, and great to have you with us today. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. All right. So, Peter, before we get into our factors that we're going to look at when it comes to small cap investing, let's take a little time to get to know you a little bit better. Now, as I recall, you've had more than 20 years of experience as a portfolio manager and over 25 years in the in investment industry as a whole. But about 10 years ago, you walked away from that and started up what's known as 5i Research, your own research company. So what gave you that entrepreneurial itch? Sure. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I actually bought my first stock when I was 11. Um, and I've been trying to figure out the stock <laughs> okay. market ever since, ever since I was 11. So anyway, I, I went through the industry and I, I became a portfolio manager. And I really, really like the stock market. I love researching companies. Um, every day is different. You have no idea what's going to happen, you know, one day, the next. And um, if you pick a great stock, you know, it's, it's a great feeling to have a stock that's a big winner and you've told everybody about it or you've made money for your investors, you know, with that stock. I, I just love it. So as I progressed through the industry, uh, you know, I got more and more responsibility. And as I progressed, I became more of a, a manager and an administrator. And I ended up as uh, my last job was at uh, chairman of Sprott Asset Management. I was in charge of a bunch of analysts. I was going to meetings that weren't stock related all the time, uh, you know, looking, dealing with the salespeople. I was on the board of directors and it's just like, you know what? I'm not really looking at stocks as much as I want to anymore. And so I sort of semi-retired and I formed 5i Research and I said, I'm going to start looking at stocks. There's a lot of great companies in Canada that are not covered by analysts. There's a lot of great companies that don't get the attention. I'm going to focus on these companies. I'm going to write some reports and let people think, you know, let people know that these are good companies. So I started 5i and uh, I kind of hit a nerve with people. People were like, wow, this is this is great. You don't manage money. You don't uh, invest in the companies that you're in researching. Uh, you're not trading. You don't take commissions. This is just all you're giving is an opinion. It's like, yeah, that's right. We're just giving you an opinion on these companies. And so it turned into this business. I hired a few smart people and I, I hired a, a new CEO who's been very, very helpful. And uh, he takes care of all the business. And we've got someone looking after all the, the administrative stuff. And I just get to do the fun stuff, which is always what I've wanted to do. So, Peter, I wanted to pivot and ask you about uh, something that goes along the lines of risk. So we know that small cap uh, sec segment can be high risk tolerance. You've had the chance to observe the market for many, many years. Now, in your experience, what are some of the traits of a successful small cap investor then? You have to have a long term focus. So you have to put in the time to to you can't get shaken out of some of these companies. So if you have a winner, you have to stick with it and it's gonna be volatile. The, you know, the, the sector itself is very volatile and you have to deal with it. When I was a small cap portfolio manager, I used to tell our traders, like, don't call me unless the stock is down or up 20% because that doesn't matter. Like once 15% is just, is just another day. Um, but once it's 20%, then that maybe something else is going on. So you have to put in the time and you have to have this, the stomach for volatility. You also have to um, you have a, a basket approach. So you can't put all your money in, in one stock, with a, one risky stock. You can't say, okay, this is it. I'm going to put all my investable cash in this stock. It's much better to have a basket approach and have six or seven names and then support the winners. And this is the part that a lot of people sort of fail at. They, they think, oh, this stock is up, so I should sell it. This stock is doubled. So I'm going to take 100% profit. Wow, that's awesome. Um, but in reality, in the small cap market, if you've got a winner, 
the bigger a company gets, the more investor eyeballs it attracts. And so when a stock does well, it gets more attention and you're more likely to get new investors. So if a stock goes from two to four dollars, people will buy it at four that they wouldn't buy it at two simply because it's a bigger company. And that's been a, a you know a really powerful move for some of the, the stocks that uh, have been successful over the past 20 years. We call it the double double is when you get a company that's growing and then all of a sudden investors are willing to pay more for it. So just because it's bigger, what we like to say is water the flowers and pull the weeds, you know, support yeah. your winners and get rid of your losers. And so obviously selling your losers is a big factor. A lot of people don't want to sell. They don't want to admit they've made the mistake. And that's a, a big, big problem. Um, on average, more stocks are going to go down in the small cap sector than up. And so you have to come into the market and say, you know what, six out of 10 stocks are going to be bad. But if I get one winner, it doesn't matter. You sort of have to change your psychology a little bit. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think helps in um, small cap investors is they have to separate uh, financial risk and volatility risk. So everyone talks about risk in terms of how much the stock goes up and down. But we like to talk about risk in terms of actually how much financial risk you're taking. So for example, if you're a small company, maybe you have $10 million in the bank and maybe you're, you've got positive cash flow and you've got positive earnings, you've been around for a few years, and maybe you've even been through a recession, but your stock bounces up and down like a yo-yo because you know no one follows you and it's illiquid, et cetera, et cetera. We wouldn't consider that that risky. That's volatility, but that's different than a company that say has $50 million in debt and is in a, in a cyclical industry and doesn't have positive cash flow and doesn't have positive earnings. You know, that's risky. And it's volatile. We, you know, you have to separate the volatility from the financial risk because, you know, as we talked about, the small cap market is very volatile. It's like up and down, and you have to say, okay, is it down because it's risky, or is it down because the market is down, or is it down because one person sold a bunch of shares that day because they needed to buy a house? And so that's really important because you can't just look at the stock price. I mean, some of my most successful investments have had, you know roller coaster type of moves over the years where just massive drawdowns where you, but nothing was wrong with the company and we really like it when the market itself goes down because everyone sells the small caps first because they're the riskiest and of course you know, when the market goes down it's got nothing to do with the company at all you know if you're making widgets and the market's down who cares you're still making your widgets and so you you sort of have to look at the you know everyone says look at the big picture but reality you're looking at the small picture with the small companies yeah absolutely no i i like that a lot i like that analogy you gave about the guardian pulling out those weeds as well there um yeah so we're talking about research and let, let let's uh let's hinge on that for a moment when when it comes to researching small cap stocks how does that usually differ from the way we approach it when it comes to large cap stocks would you say Sure. I mean, it is quite different. So first off, you don't have uh, a bunch of Bay Street and Wall Street analysts helping you out. You can't yeah. you can't pull up research reports on these companies because most of the time there isn't there isn't one. I mean, we're trying to mm -hmm. fill that gap a little bit at Five Eye Research, but we're a small company. We can only cover so many so many companies, and so you have to do your own research, and that involves an understanding of financial statements more so than you would if you were relying on other people. And you have to be able to understand how much company how much money the company is losing at, while it grows, what their cash flow situation is, what their access to capital is. Uh, we like a big, big brother relationship where a small company has a relationship with a larger company that, you know, if they get into trouble, they've got, they've got a friend that can support them. Um, we like to look at how a management team is paid. And this is, this is very different than a large cap company. So if you're a CEO of a large cap company, you know, you might, you might make $2 million a year. And you might have some options. You know, you're you're a seasoned executive. You're running the company. You get paid in options, but you get a huge salary along the way, and everything's fine. A small cap company, your manager might not make any money at all. It might be all stock um, because the company can't afford to pay you two million dollars as the CEO. And so we like to look at how much stock the management team owns versus how much they're paid. And you know, we don't like a situation where a company is paying their executives too much money because then the executives aren't motivated enough. You want them to have skin in the game. You want them to own shares. And this is all public available information, but you got to do some digging to see exactly, you know, how much stock they own in their own company. And 
what else in terms of the research is you have to you have to understand as we're talking the long-term nature of it um Mm -hmm. it costs money to grow and you have to be able to finance that and you also have to understand that a lot of small cap companies are promoted um and they're promoted by paid researchers they've got investor relations firms that get twenty thousand dollars a month to talk up these stories and you can often get a company that you know the stock price is doing really well and It looks like it's a great success, but when you drill down to the fundamentals, they're really not doing that much. It's just getting hyped, it's getting promoted, and you have to avoid those situations really at all costs. I mean, you have to, you have to, you know, roll up your sleeves, get your pencil sharpened, get your calculator charged up, and and you have to do the real research. Yeah, no, absolutely. Those are all fantastic points you hit on there, Peter. So let's go in, let's dive into research itself now. So we've got five factors that you commonly look at when investing in small cap stocks. The first one, and you you talked a little bit about this, is having a skilled management team. Why do you think this is going to be so important in your view? Well, if I could if I could use our own example. So when I started Mm -hmm. 5i, I mean, I was a stock picker, I was a portfolio manager. I didn't I didn't know how to do anything else. I didn't yeah. even know how to pay the taxes, right? So you have to be able to have a, a management team that can cover all those bases. And you have to have a management team that can, you know, um, if you're making a product or a service, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to manage the, the finances. You have to be able to manage the people. You have to be able to manage the investors and the expectations um, and the cash flow. Like it, it just comes all down to the management team and what their experience is. It doesn't guarantee you anything but it's like, oh, okay, at least this management team can raise money, they can talk to investors, they can solve problems, maybe they've been through a recession. And if they've sold a company, it's like they can exit. And that's very important as well. You have to have a, a way out, you have to have an exit plan from your investment as well. So we like to look at a company where they tell us what they're gonna do, and then a year later, we check we check off to see what they did and see whether they met their expectations. And that, mm-hmm. you know, that takes a full year before you even got any feedback. And a lot of investors won't put in that time, but it's it's important to do. Right. No, absolutely. No, that, that's fantastic. The the second factor uh, is a qualitative one and along sort of along the same lines is having a strong competitive position. Now, how can an investor tell if a company has this uh, on that uh, on that scale in the market? Sure. It's, this is this is one of the harder things to to analyze as a as an investor. First off. Ask yourself why you're why this company is even in existence. So, you know, if you've started XYZ company, it's like, okay, what what's the goal here? What are they actually trying to do? And if what they're trying to do is something that another company already does, then it's like, okay, what makes you special? What are you going to do that's different? Do you have a new product? Do you have a new service? Do you have a better mousetrap? One of the things that we like to look at is your your growth versus the industry. So, for example, I'll just use a just a basic example for for illustrative purposes. Say you're an auto company, and the auto industry is growing at three percent a year, and this little company comes out and it's growing at twenty percent a year or thirty percent a year. It's like, okay, so you're doing better than the industry on average. Now my job is to figure out what's going on. Why are your sales more than the other person's sales? And it might be just because you're a small company and you want a big contract, and that's a one thing you have to watch out for is a single contract can change the numbers dramatically for a small company. So you have to sort of look at that over a consistent period of time. You also look at how much do they spend on research and development. So if you go into the say the high tech sector, and you think you know your company says you've got a great a, a great new product, you look at well how much did it cost you to get that product? And sometimes you look back and it's like you know what you've only spent five hundred thousand dollars developing this product that you think is going to take on Google. Google spends yeah. $30 billion a year on research. One of the real big issues with small cap investing is say you do have a successful company and say you have great margins and they start making a lot of money, that's going to attract in- investor attention for sure, but it's also going to attract competitive attention. And there's going to be a hundred big companies are going to try and figure out what you're doing and try and steal your customers or you know poach on your business or replicate what you're doing. So mm-hmm. you really have to sort of pay attention to the big picture in terms of you know, you have to do something different. You have to have some sort of advantage. Yeah, no, absolutely. The The third factor that you've mentioned is a healthy balance sheet. And and I think you mentioned this ahead of uh, when we were talking briefly, 
that investors should be able to understand this. So when we are looking at a healthy balance sheet, what what does it look like for a small cap stock? What are you looking for there? Sure. I mean, ideally, ideally you've, you're sitting on a bunch of cash. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, unfortunately, sometimes you, that cash comes from issuing new stock and you know, there's nothing wrong with issuing new stock. That's the whole reason the stock market's in, in existence is for companies to raise money. Um, but we like to watch how you've issued that stock. So for example, if you raised money at $20, you know, five years ago and your stock's at $3 and you, you ran out of money and now you're issuing stock at $3, you know, that's a red flag for us. I mean, that's not the way it's supposed to go. It's supposed to go the other way. Um, but if your stock was $5 and now you're raising money at 10, you know, you're a growing company, sure, we're, we're comfortable with that. You need the money, that's, you can raise your money at 10. Um, looking at cash flow is important as well. And this is where we like to eliminate the, the micro caps. I mean, we want a company that at least established enough to have some sales and have some profitability and have some cash flow. Because then if times get rough, you're not gonna go bankrupt. Um, you know, obviously if you have a lot of debt and you start losing money, then most of your focus goes on survival and most of your focus and your cash goes to pay down that debt. You know, it's really, really hard to grow a company if all you're doing is paying off your, your creditors. But at least eliminate some of the risks by eliminating the, the negative cash flow and the negative profitability as much as you can. I mean, if you're looking at a new company that's, you know, developing something new, it may be unprofitable for five years, but you have to understand how are you going to finance those five years and at what cost is it going to come to your existing shareholders? So, you know, a little bit of combination of both, you know, make sure you understand how they're going to raise the money and what they're going to do if they get into trouble. But ideally you're, you have less risk if the company is already profitable. Yeah, absolutely. Now I wanted to pick on the, and talk about debt for a moment, because as I've understood it generally, when, when a company does go public, Debt is in moderation, let me put it this way, isn't necessarily a bad thing for a company. In, in fact, it's almost encouraged to really expand and grow. So how do you tell if a company is is holding too much debt versus just sort of that moderation? Sure. I mean, there's there's all sorts of ratios you can look at. You can look at interest coverage. You can look at cash to debt flow or debt to cash flow ratios. You can look at the maturity of debt. Obviously, a company that has all of their debt coming due next year is riskier than a company that's got it spread out over a period of years. Um, there's nothing really wrong with debt. And, and in fact, you know, up to a point, it, it is very, very useful to a company. First off, interest is tax deductible. Um, so you, there's, a, there's a tax capital allocation efficiency to it. But also maybe the company doesn't wanna sell new shares. I mean, if you're an executive at a company and you own 20% of your company and it's doing well, like, why would you want to sell new shares when you could raise money in the debt market and finance your growth that way? So it's really just, it, it all becomes down to what's reasonable for the company. But if you're growing and you have cash flow and you want to, you know, build another factory, you know, absolutely. If you can keep your leverage down to a certain level, then that's, that's appropriate. I mean, again, any debt will add risk and debt is more risky than cash, but it, you can't say, oh, that company's got debt. I don't want to invest in it. You have to, again, do the research and find out what the debt's being used for and what happens if there's a recession next year and why, you know, why are they raising this money instead of raising stock? And, and often it's a good answer, but mm -hmm. often it's a bad answer as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I like that. So you want debt, you want to look for debt that's serviceable and usually organically serviceable. So it's taking it from its positive cash flow. And we're now at our fourth criteria. And so this is one that is, uh, that's took me by surprise. It's that you look for a dividend payment when it comes to small cap companies. Now, often we associate dividend payments with large cap or blue chip companies rather than the small caps, since you would think that they would be using those profits to reinvest, to expand or grow those businesses. So why does a dividend payment make your list? Nothing's exclusive here. I, I, I should emphasize that. I mean, yeah. just, just because they pay a dividend doesn't make it a good company. And just because they don't pay a dividend doesn't make it a bad company. But what we like to look for is, is the first dividend for a company. So when a company issues their first dividend, they've generally been around for a period of time and they're generally established enough so they know that they can give away, not give away, but they can share some of their profits with their shareholders. So it, right away, it takes you to a new level. It's like, okay, here's a company that has the confidence to pay out a dividend. So they're not worried about their future very much. They're not gonna have to hoard cash. They're already established up to a point. So kind of gets you, you know, it raises your floor a little bit in terms of 
the company you're looking at. Number two, um, for small companies, as we mentioned, they don't get a lot of attention from the analysts. And you know, you don't have 50 brokers talking about this company. And often a dividend will get them some attention. They'll get them a little bit more attention. They'll get more investors and their stock price can go up and their cost of capital can go down. And it can be quite positive to them on a long-term basis if their stock price can go up because of their dividend. Number three, investors tend to uh, keep their dividend stocks longer. So as we mentioned, stocks, you know, small caps are volatile, but a small cap with a dividend will be less volatile. And so you're more likely to keep it for the long term because those big giant swings are going to be reduced a little bit because of that specific dividend. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So let's talk about the last factor then that we're when looking at small cap stocks. And this one is uh, you look for those stocks that are trading closer to their 52 week highs or even perhaps even their all time highs. Now, this is an interesting one because we often hear the adage, you know, buy low and sell high. So why might investing in companies that are already at these sort of high points make sense in your view? First off, you can't just buy them because they're at a new high. Obviously, it's, a, it's more of a screening process. But what, what a new high tells you is it tells you that someone else really likes this company. And so now it's like, okay, if, you're, if you've got 50 stocks to look at, you now have a friend who says this one's, this one's a good one. And if you have a company trading at an all-time high, it's like, okay, somebody somewhere in the world thinks this is the greatest company it's ever been ever. And it's now trading at an all-time high. It's like, so it can eliminate some of the, um, it can help you screen out what you should start looking for. Now your job is to, of course, find out why is it a new high? You know, what's going on? Why did an investor pay him so much for this company when it was cheaper, you know, a year ago? So that's one reason. It just sort of eliminates, there's 10,000 stocks that you can look at in North America, you know, and if you can eliminate 9,000 of them, that's pretty helpful as far as we're concerned. Um, the other thing we touched on a little bit, a larger company simply gets more attention because it's bigger. You can even drill down a little bit more and say momentum can feed upon itself. And you can get a situation where, you know, as stock goes up, people are more confident with that company because their stock's going up. They're actually more likely to support it. They're making more money. And you can even get a situation where if a company goes up to certain levels, investors could borrow against that stock and they can buy more of that stock. So again, it's it's mostly a screening process, but in terms of new ideas that I've had over the past 20 years, it's probably the single best source of new ideas and say, okay, what is going on? Here's a company that I've never heard of before, yet every day it hits a new high. I got to find out what's going on. And sometimes it's a good reason. And sometimes it's a hyped reason. And sometimes it's just because it's in the right sector at the right time. And, you know, those are the ones we're not interested in, but the ones we're interested in are, Hey, it's up because sales doubled. Yeah. or earnings tripled, or or they just signed a new contract, or they just won a patent on something like that. Those are the ones you're looking for. So, Peter, this actually is going to conclude our, our interview segment. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your perspectives on this. You know, it was truly insightful. And I'm sure, like myself and many others, we definitely have garnered a better appreciation of investing small cap stocks and, and have a little bit of a guidepost as to where to begin with. We're not done just yet. Uh, and uh, we'll transition now, in fact, in, in just a moment to our Q&A segment. So, uh, Peter, I know kindly that I'm sure a lot of our viewers will have some questions to post to you. So we're going to get to that in a moment. But uh, just before we switch to that, we wanted to be able to show clients of TD Direct Investing how you can research some of the factors that we spoke about today using Web Broker. So we're going to go from here and jump into Web Broker and take a look at how you can do some of that research. All right. Once you have logged into Web Broker, in order to search for our small cap stocks, we're going to use a screener tool. The screener tool basically allows investors to filter and sort through thousands of different securities based on specific criteria that they were looking for in order to focus on the ones uh, that we want. Now, in order to get to the screener tool from on Web Broker, we're going to first click on the research tab up here. Uh, in the drop down, we're going to go to the tools column. And third from the bottom, we're going to click right here where it says screeners and jump right into it. Now, once you get into the screeners tool over here, we're going to hover over to the right and click where it says add new, which will allow us to set up a new screen. 
first and foremost, what we're going to do is we're going to narrow down our search to a particular market segment. And we know that we're looking for small cap stocks within the Canadian space. So I'm going to click on this where it says exchange and just choose any Canadian exchange to just filter for those. And once you've done that, we can go ahead and start adding our factors or criteria that we talked about or discussed. And we're going to add a few of those ones that are available here. To begin with, we're going to click on this folder right here, which says popular, and we're going to select market capitalization. That's going to be our primary one we're going to start with. I'm going to click on add over here. Now, remember, market capitalization tells us the valuation that defines a small cap stock. So over here, we're going to set the lower bound to uh, 100 million and it's a, and you, you can just type that in or you can even use this scroll bar to adjust the value. And on the top side, we're gonna adjust it to 1.5 billion as we had discussed. And we're gonna set that over here and just hit enter once you've inputted that number. Our second factor we're gonna look at was we talked about having a healthy balance sheet and that involves uh, one of the factors we talked about was debt. So I'm gonna click on this debt folder and I'm gonna add this ratio right here with, which is called the current ratio. Now the current ratio is a ratio that measures a company's ability to pay its short-term obligations. Uh, and when we say short-term obligations, that simply means it's debt that are due within one year. Now, the ratio is uh, taking the, the current assets divided by the current liabilities. And assets are simply defined as those that are cash or cash-like and dividing by liabilities, which is simply mean the debt that needs to be paid by the company within a year or less. Our current ratio uh, when it comes to these stocks is we want to do 1.5. That tells us we have uh, obviously a, enough room to cover the debt. And we can keep the upper threshold as uh, just use this bar and keep it to maximum there. All right. So in other words, what we're saying is that for every $1.15 assets that we have, there's $1 in debt at the very minimum that we're carrying. OK, so there's enough room to pay that. The next factor we're going to look at is dividends. And so we're going to click on the dividends folder because we're looking for perhaps small cap stocks that pay a dividend. I'm going to use this metric here, dividend coverage. Now, dividend coverage is uh, uh, what it tells us is that for the profit that the company generates, how much as a percentage of uh, uh, total profits is the dividend amount being paid out? So we can go over here and we can select a, a number over here. And so the actual calculation for the dividend coverage is taking the earnings per share number or EPS and dividing it by the annual dividend that's paid out. And anytime you're unfamiliar with any of these ratios, if you click on this little arrow beside it, it's going to give you an explainer, a little brief of what that means. All right. And so we want to keep this ratio at a minimum of 200. So all we're saying is that for every $2 in earnings per share that we have, there's $1 at the minimum that's being paid out as a dividend. And we're going to keep this uh, on, the, on the maximum end. And you can just drag this bar to keep it at the maximum on the high end. And then finally, we're going to add the trading uh, folder. And over here, we were looking for stocks close to the 52 weeks high. So I'm going to choose the percent change from 52 week high and add that in. Now, for this value, value I'm going to do a 20% variance off of that on the downside of the 52 week high, just because uh, small cap stocks tend to be volatile and we don't want to, you know, remove any quality small cap stocks just due to market volatility, as Peter had mentioned. So we're going to keep this to the maximum level. Once you've done that, we've inputted our four criteria that we have so far that are measurable here. And we've got 28 results populated. And if we scroll down, we're going to see those results show up over here. And if you want to see the, the full list, you can click on view more right over here. And then that's going to populate that list in its entirety there that we've screened for. From here, it's just about a matter of kind of diving deeper into any particular one that you might be interested in. I'm just going to pick hardwood distribution second from the list. And we're going to click on this action button here and go to overview. Just And we're going to navigate over once we're on the overview page to the report section here. As this, where the report section is going to give us a glimmer into some of those other two qualitative factors we talked about, which is the team management, as well as the market uh, addressable market that they have for a particular company there. So you can dive through these reports and look through all of that information. Okay, and there you have it. So that is the way you would use the screener tool in Web Broker to apply some of those factors to create that short list of your small cap stocks. So from now, let's get to our Q&A session. And so Peter, we'll hop right to it. I'm sure the questions are queued up. And so we'll move to our Q&A segment now. 